My name is Sean Griffin, and I'm a junior fellow in the Society of Fellows at Dartmouth College, where I'm affiliated with the Russian department, as well as the history department. The title of my new book is The Liturgical Past in Byzantium and Early Rus, and it will be published with Cambridge University Press uh, in the series uh, Cambridge Studies in Medieval Life and Thought Fourth series in August of 2019. The idea, the kind of the myth of origins uh, for the project uh, comes out of a class I was taking as a graduate student at UCLA. Uh, it's one of the few departments that continues to insist that its students study uh, the medieval period. And in a class on pre-modern Russia with uh, Professor Gail Linhoff, we were reading the famous tale of Princess Olga's journey to Constantinople. And I just casually remarked during the course of the, of the class period that, oh, you know, some of this language in the passage are from the liturgical services of the Orthodox Church. And she kind of stopped and looked over at me and said, I don't think anybody's ever noticed that before. You should write a dissertation about that. Um, and so here I am 10 years later, very pleased to present uh, my advisor with the final results. Well, you're asking the right questions. The answer is zero, zilch, none. None of them survive. The earliest surviving redaction of what we now call the Povist Vremenich Liet, or what's sometimes translated as the tale of bygone years. In my book, I use the term Rus primary chronicle. It's been called by a number of different names over the centuries, the Kievan Primary Chronicle, the Russian Primary Chronicle, the Chronicle of Nestor. It's, it's had uh, many names as our kind of understanding of what the text is has changed over the centuries. And this is something I talk about in the second chapter of the book. Uh, but to answer your question, no. From the, well, chronicle writing didn't exist in the ninth century. The, the Rus were, are completely unknown in, they have no native forms of writing prior to the Christianization, which occurs uh, roughly around the year 988. So the end of the 10th century. Then the first half century of, of Christian Rus uh, is something that Simon Franklin has called the dark ages of, of, of Kievan Rus, because there are no extant samples of native writing, apart from maybe a few scribbles on birch marks. So to get back to your question, the earliest surviving redaction is the Laurentian Codex, which dates to 1377. So we're dealing with a text here that was written in 1377. And for the past 300 years, or that's an exaggeration, since the late 18th century, so let's say about 250 years almost, uh, there's this remarkable tradition coming out of, of course, Russia and, and a large part out of late 18th, early 19th century German philology uh, of studying this document and trying to figure out what it's made out of. Where did it come from? How many, how many different tales and texts and earlier chronicle compilations uh, is it made up of? And when were these done and who did them? And so the history of chronicle studies, which is, is really connected with this very famous figure named Alexei Shakhmatov. He's, he's the great doyen of chronicle studies who was working in the very beginning of the 20th century. And he's hailed by some as the great genius of the field, uh, the one who revolutionizes everything and after which basically the entire history of the field is a footnote to Shakhmatov. Uh, this is a narrative uh, that a number of scholars are now challenging, particularly what I kind of call the Kievan school um, right now that's in Ukraine and that's associated with Tetiana Vilkul and Alexei Talichko and, and a, a young scholar named Vadim uh, Eristov. So what, are my, what were my methods? What were my primary sources? Really, so it developed out of my dissertation. And what I did in my dissertation was kind of the old fashioned, tedious work of historical philology uh, that sadly has fallen out of favor <laughs> in a lot of uh, humanities disciplines today. Basically, I spent a year and a half of my life with the text of the Rus Primary Chronicle in a critical edition format, 
on one side of my table and with uh, church books, as many, you know, some of the texts of the church books, modern editions of the church books. And then, of course, what I was able to access on Google. And so to understand what I was doing, I have to give viewers an idea of not only what the Roost Primary Chronicle was, but also what the liturgy is and what church books are. So because if you don't understand what we're dealing with with these uh, manuscript resources, then I think you're going to have a hard time understanding what I ended up doing in my first book. Um, so very quickly, the Chronicles. As I said earlier, first, the, the oldest surviving one dates to 1377. But there's this long tradition of identifying earlier authors and earlier what are called svot, or so it can be it can be translated as like a compilation. Okay, so it is generally accepted that the version of of early Rus history that we have in the Rus Primary Chronicle was written in Kiev, or was copied, I should say, was redacted, was brought together in Kiev, probably in the second decade of the 12th century. All right, so sometime in the 1110s. Everybody pretty much agrees with this. But what's important, what was absolutely crucial and the, the fundamental premise of my entire work was who was doing the copying, who was doing the redacting, who was doing the writing. And the answer, of course, in the Christian Middle Ages is clerics, monks bishops, priests. Um, so there was a sacerdotal clerical caste who were the history writers of the age. Like this is a simple but crucial fact that the men who were employed to serve the liturgical services 365 days a year, morning, evening, and night, these are the very same men who were also the ones who wrote down history in the Middle Ages. What I did for the first time was to try to show how their immersion, their daily immersion in those liturgical rites influenced their perception of history and what they ended up writing down as the uh, origin story of basically what is now East Slavic civilization. So Russia, Ukraine, Belarus. And what I discovered, what I think I discovered, what I hope that I prove uh, in my first book is that the core myth of origins of Christian Rus. So if you're in Moscow and you stop, or you're in Kiev or you're in Minsk and you stop somebody on the street today and you say, hey, where did Russia come from? Or where did Ukraine come from? They're probably going to tell you the stories that are written down between 955 and 1015 in the Rus Primary Chronicle. Okay? So they're going to tell you about the baptism of Olga in Constantinople. And they're going to tell you about the, the mass baptism of, of the Rus in the, in the Nynaper River in 988. And maybe they'll tell you about the martyrdom of Princes Boris and Gleb, right? So this is where Atkudi Yest Pashla Zimlya Ruskaya, right, is a very famous opening line of the Chronicle suggests. And what I show in the book, in this just extraordinarily um, series of close readings, is that well, actually this native mythology derived from the liturgical services of the Byzantine Empire. Does that make sense? So very briefly, very broadly, I showed that the story of the baptism of, of Princess Olga in Constantinople in 955 is actually based on the service for baptizing pagans in the great church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, okay? I showed that her textual figure in the Chronicle is also based on a series of feasts that had to do with holy four mothers and four runners and, and the Theotokos, the mother of God. Okay. So in my book, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not treating what really happened. Does that make sense? Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to tell my readers what I think really happened in real life. I'm deconstructing 
these historical textual representations and showing that certain parts of them are very densely comprised of liturg of materials from liturgical hymns, liturgical readings, liturgical prayers. Um, so for instance, it, I, it, in my opinion, it would be better to say that Princess Olga is, is not so much a textual or historical figure as she is a liturgical one. She, she, she is the, she is the mother of Christian Rus in the same way that Joachim and Anna are the mother of Mary in the same way that Mary and Joseph are ultimately the mother of Christ, right? There's this whole tradition, this whole liturgical mythology uh, surrounding how holy people, the chosen of God are born into the world. And basically what happened in Kiev in the early 12th century is that the, the, the native chroniclers, the Kievan chroniclers took these liturgical paradigms, which they had internalized from, from thousands of hours of liturgical worship. And they crafted a whole story about the beginning of their land that conformed, um, that conformed it to the myth of Christian origins that about the Byzantine empire that they knew from the religious services. So in other words, the his, the sacred history they sang at church, they quote unquote, russified and turned in to a modified uh, myth of sacred origins for their own people. So for instance, in 988, when Prince Vladimir baptizes the, the, the Kievans in the, in the, in the river, I show that he's actually being depicted as the first bishop of Rus, and he's standing in the river and he's saying the prayers that only a bishop could pray during the baptismal rites. I show that in 996, when he enters the Church of the Tithes and consecrates it, he again says the prayers that only a bishop can pray. So one of the most provocative arguments I make about Vladimir is that he's actually depicted as the first bishop of Rus, which is entirely non-canonical. It didn't happen like that. But chroniclers writing 150 years later they had to invent a story, you know, scholars generally agree, oh, what happened? By then, nobody remembered what had happened. Nobody had written it down. We don't know. You know, I think Shakhmatov said they had to build an edifice upon the sand. Um, and the story they ended up um, creating or editing together was actually based on the story of St. Constantine the Great from the liturgical services. So the whole figure of St. Vladimir the Great that we find in the Chronicle from even his pagan past to his death in 1015, all of it has been redacted together, I argue in the book, in order to make Vladimir look like the new Constantine of Rus. So what I, how I do that is I, I, in great detail, reconstruct the stories that the liturgical services told about St. Constantine and his mother, St. Helena, right? Now, this was not easy to do because, and this gets back to your earlier questions. So, what it, so that, so one side of it is the chronicle. The other part, the really hard part, was then trying to figure out what church books survived in what form from the late, you know, during the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, basically. And that is extraordinarily complicated. The history of liturgy is like one of the great philological puzzles in all of um like in my opinion eurasian history it's extraordinarily complex liturgists will devote their entire life to studying the historical trajectory of a single church book in other words so you have this one manuscript over here that has its own extraordinarily complex textual history but the textual history of the church books is actually far more complex because think about it this was a a narrative ritual story world that was performed 365 days a year all day long so if you stack up all the church books that are required to do those performances they can fill up half of a room so it was a real challenge um, and a, a remarkable opportunity to learn a lot of stuff i didn't know to try to put together the story um, based on the, the research of a lot of fantastic liturgists who with, without whose work I could never have even begun to come close to writing this, to this study. Um, and so what I eventually ended up doing was just showing how the sacred mythology contained in these church books, which was performed by the clerics who were the men writing history in early Rus, how that 
totally shaped their entire conception of what history was. Because the ultimate argument I make in the book is that liturgy wasn't ultimately just influencing how history was written down in books. Really, it's what I call the liturgical past, which was performed at the divine services. Uh, that was the experience of history in the early Middle Ages. Um, it was the experience of history itself. Okay, so we have this very modern and, in my view, perhaps an anachronistic idea of what history meant in the 11th to 12th centuries. And we picture this chronicler sitting at his desk in the scriptorium, let's say, uh, surrounded by earlier Byzantine chronicles and other tales, and he's busily redactically, redacting and compiling the first written history of, of the Rus. I'm not suggesting in my book that that's necessarily inaccurate, but what I am suggesting is that it is perhaps incomplete because the clerical chroniclers of Rus were, were liturgical celebrants first, and they were history writers second. Okay, so I think that we, we, we have to take into account not only the historiographical past, which was contained in books, we, we have to determine to what extent their conception of history was determined by the liturgical past that they celebrated uh, each and every day during the divine services. This was the past of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Mary and Jesus Christ and the apostles, of Byzantine emperors, ascetics, and church fathers. So my hypothesis in, in the work is that basically historiography first arose in Kiev as an attempt to make the native past conform to this liturgical past, this Byzantine liturgical past. And my evidence for this is the myth of Christian origins preserved in the Rus primary chronicle. You'd be curious to know that my book opens in Moscow in November 2016 with Vladimir Putin and Patriarch Kirill of Moscow uh, consecrating and unveiling that massive new statue of Prince Vladimir, which now towers over Budovitskaya Square, just outside the walls of the Kremlin. Um, and actually, I'm now I'm currently working on a second book and a, and a chapter on it where I explain the ecclesiastical and political backstory to the erection of that monument, and it, it, it has to do. It's basically a part of this mythology of Holy Rus, which Putin and Kirill have kind of created uh, to fill the ideological vacuum left by the fall of the Soviet Union. The, it, the timing of my book coming out is, is really interesting because this, what I call the myth of Christian origins of Rus, and particularly the, the set of sacred stories that are associated with Prince Vladimir, Saint Prince Vladimir the Great, this this narrative has become the touchstone for the for ferocious contemporary identity politics battles. So you have on the one hand right now you have uh, you know Patriarch Filaret and until his you know he was recently not reelected Poroshenko. They started doing these these things called the uh, the Day of the Baptism of Rus celebrations, which which were happening every year, and they were centered around the monument of Vladimir in Kiev and the one in Moscow. And what would happen is that those in favor of a of a independent Ukraine, uh, looking towards the European Union, they would stand in front of the monument of Vladimir, you know, celebrate a liturgical service, and then tell this story about how uh, the entrance of Rus into um, the Byzantine faith was actually its entrance into Europe and the European Union. And then in Moscow, and this is the reason the statue was built there, because the Putin and Kirill were no longer allowed after Maidan, obviously, to go to Kiev. And so they had to build their own statue of Vladimir, and they hold their own, what I call, teleliturgical rituals in front of it. And they tell a very different story about Vladimir and how the baptism of Rus is the baptism of one united people who are now the nations of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, and how um, you know that that unity that was created in the in the in the Kievan baptism font cannot be broken. It is their sacred duty um, to to protect it. You know, so it really becomes it's the it's the it's the uh, backstory for a revanchist political ideology aimed at keeping the Russian Empire together. So it's it's, it's surprisingly relevant. <laughs> no, no, it's a great question. So your question is first: How did 
Byzant- the Byzantine liturgy and East Roman church books get to Kiev and when. And then if I understood you correctly, how much did the liturgy change from its Byzantine origins after that? So this, I, I actually, I open with this narrative towards the beginning of my book because it's absolutely crucial. And the history of how church books arrived in Kiev from Constantinople has been significantly rewritten uh, in the last couple of decades, particularly by two uh, liturgists in Russia, uh, Mikhail Zhiltov, who is a priest, and a man named, I believe it's Alexei Pentkovsky. So these two guys, have they're, they're, they're excellent liturgists. And whereas before, we thought that the that church books from Constantinople were translated in Kiev at one time and one place from Studite originals. So from the the books that were part of what Robert Taft has called the Studite synthesis of the you know eighth, ninth, tenth centuries. Well, what jo, what Joltov and Pentkovsky have shown is that that's not the case at all, and by kind of um, forensically studying the extant liturgical church books, which mostly come from Novgorod, because you have to remember the Mongols come sweeping in in the mid 13th century and as and, and sacked Kiev. And as a result, um, no, almost zero church books survive from pre-Mongol Rus um, from Kiev. All the ones that, that do survive uh, are mostly from Novgorod. Um, so most of my, uh, primary sources, when I'm like looking at texts of the Menaean, these are almost strictly based on, um, actually Novgorodian church books and not Kievan church books. So what Pentkovsky and Zoltov have shown is that it actually wasn't the, the, the exact practices in Constantinople at that time. Actually, the extant church books show that it was probably a now lost Greek liturgical tradition somewhere between the Adriatic and the Thermaic Gulf, possibly Archdiocese of Thessalonica, or one slightly north of there, say in in Epirus. Um, So the church books probably went from there, then to Ohrid, all right, in the the far western reaches of the first Bulgarian empire. So you can't imagine that these church books were driven like straight from the gates of Constantinople or Thessalonica uh, to the gates of Kiev. It didn't happen. It was a much more complex process. Um, but eventually, they arrive in Kiev, and the the, the continuity of the, of Orthodox church books of Byzantine and Rus church books over time is spectacular. Now there is another major period of change that occurs after the Mongol period um, when they move from the Studite Tipicon to the Jerusalem Tipicon, but that's way too complicated to get into right now. Um, But long story short, the argument can be made, and many liturgists have made it, is that for all of the million little discrepancies, because you have to remember, this is all before the printing press. This is all before really any idea of standard, the the kind of the ideas of textual standardization that we carry around in our heads, like that just didn't exist. It wasn't wasn't even possible. Um, There's this this kind of famous passage uh, written by Nikon of the Black Mountain where he's talking about organizing his Tipicon for his monastery. Um, And he describes going around all these monasteries and being very frustrated because none of the, none of the church books exactly agreed with one another, you know? So how was he supposed to know what to write down since they were all a little bit different? Um, And that is definitely the case, you know, but that said with all of those tiny discrepancies in mind, and you know, maybe this feast in this book is celebrated on this day, but in this book it's celebrated on a different day or this book is, you know, has uses these spellings and this other Menaean uses these spellings, right? For all of those um, orthographical, etymological, you know, textual differences, there's a stunning continuity. You know, it, it's 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 all almost exactly the same. Um, and what's interesting is that my argument in my book, it actually doesn't even matter, right? Because I'm talking about like, so in my, in my, I, I put forward a new theory of liturgy in the book. Okay. I see liturgy. I interpret liturgy. I theorize that liturgy uh, 
is an imperial Roman technology for the creating and controlling of cultural memory. Okay, so what is liturgy? I mean, we have this very kind of popular notion in our heads, maybe of like this kind of very mystical experience and there's incense and there's candles and it's 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 kind of magical maybe for those who are don't have a, a lot of experience of it but in my view the liturgy is a storytelling technology like a group of human beings enters into a large painted room and they ritually sing stories to themselves over and over and over again and they sing the same stories every year on the same days, right? That's what the liturgical calendar is. So on May 21st, they ritually sing to themselves the story of the conversion of the Roman Empire under St. Constantine, okay? Um, you know, and that, that's in addition to all of the, you know, Old Testament and biblical feasts. Because that's one of the amazing things about the Byzantine liturgical past is that it incorporates all you know multiple periods of history that then become sacred history so when you're when you're at the liturgy the history of the Isra israelites and the history of the new testament church and the history of the byzantines all meld all fuse into this single liturgical story world this single liturgical past and what i've tried to do in the book is reconstruct that liturgical past for a non-specialist audience and show them how basically Roman political mythology um, enters into the equation, okay? Because while they're at church, you know, these monks and these clerics, they're not just singing hymns about the crucifixion or the incarnation or the exodus, right? They're also singing sacred hymns about right-believing emperors and empresses and of holy soldiers and of of god chosen emperors and and kings right so on top of like the core biblical mythos you have what i believe is essentially a um a technology for creating divinely sanctioned political dynasties okay and that's what's at work in the Rus primary chronicle too i know this gets kind of complicated and i hope it's clear um but what I, one of my big ideas I put forward in the book is something I call the liturgical loop, which is really a new theory of canonization in the Middle Ages and a new theory of the relationship between historiography and liturgy. So what I show in the final chapter of the book is that the way royal saints were made in Rus was actually a function of the relationship between history, ritual, and then history writing again at a later date. Do, do, you, do, I, do you mind if I try to explain this a little better? Because it's really an interesting idea and it's, it's really complicated. Um, so what I tried, what I show in, the, in, in this series of, of what I call philological excavations, okay? So I, I take these texts and I just kind of dig uh, all the liturgical citations out of them and then try to reconstruct what they would have meant to an early medieval audience. Okay. And again, I do that for Vladimir. I do that for Olga. I do that for Boris and Glenn. But then what's remarkable, and I only noticed this, um, you know, after I was into the project for several years, is that the very stories, the very myths about Olga and Vladimir and Boris and Gleb that eventually get written down in the Rus Primary Chronicle, and which come from, in large part, the liturgical services of the Byzantine Church, those very narratives are then the ones that get end up getting chanted at their liturgical services when they're finally become saints several centuries later. So liturgy becomes history and becomes liturgy again. And it was this, it was this sacred cycle, it was this liturgical loop that was responsible for the making of royal saints and that was responsible for the sacralization of political power. And there's this remarkable visual manifestation of this, or there was, it's no longer, it's, fortunately it's been lost. But if you go into Sofiski Sabor, Sabor, so St. Sophia's Cathedral in Kiev, which miraculously still stands today, and is, in my opinion, the greatest <laughs> early medieval church in the world. You know, if you, if you, so you walk in, you know, of course, 
you know, the Theotokos is probably the first one you're going to, to notice. But then if you turn to leave in the early Middle Ages, you would have seen this icon. And scholars think that it depicted uh, Prince Vladimir and his son, Prince Yaroslav the Great on one side, and then Princess Olga and Yaroslav's wife on the other side, and then they kind of, the, the rest of the, of the of the uh, of the imperial family or the I mean, the princely family, right? Um, and so, to me, this this icon is the perfect symbol of what the relationship between liturgy and historiography were doing in the early Middle Ages. It was by writing history that that these members of a political dynasty were all ultimately able to enter into the same liturgical past as Mary and Jesus and Peter and Paul and Constantine and Helena and, and St. George the Dragon Slayer, right? Like, so in that church on those walls, you have icons of all of those great saints, right? And who's there in the middle of them as well? This, you know, 11th century Rus dynasty, you know? And the way they got there, the way they entered into the liturgical past, which is painted on those walls, is because the sacred paradigms of the liturgy were used to create the history of the story of their family. And so when later generations of chroniclers um, who, you know, who went to all the same liturgical services, when they, when they read the Bruce primary chronicle, they looked at it and said, Oh my gosh, Vladimir is just like Constantine. And Oh my gosh, Olga is just like Helena. And Oh my gosh, Boris and Gleb are just like martyrs there. And, you know, so clearly there are saints too. But the reason they were, the reason that, that that association was made in the minds of these chroniclers was because those very stories were built on the liturgical paradigms to begin with, and so that's how a dynasty became a sacred dynasty. And that, in my opinion, is why early medieval rulers were so willing to convert to Christianity, perhaps, and why they were willing to invest a fortune of their hard-won riches in building super expensive cathedrals, employing a full-time clergy. Um, paying for church books, paying for history writing. Like it was a political weapon. It, you know, the liturgy wasn't just pious praying and singing. It was a way of making your grip on political power unquestionable, right? Like you didn't doubt the virgin birth and you didn't doubt the Lord's Supper. And so you could not doubt the legitimacy of Prince Vladimir's or Prince Yaroslav's reign because, you know, Clearly, they were the chosen of God. Learning the history of the church services from the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th centuries was stunning. Um, learning about, well, we'll see, one of the things that I think will surprise liturgists in my book, if I can you know, get any of them to read it, is that, you know, so, the, so liturgists are these, you know, they're remarkable scholars and they know all of these languages and I just am so impressed by their whole discipline. Um, but at the same time, they, they kind of tend to, to be a hard group to kind of become a part of. <laughs> so they're very, they devote their careers to reconstructing, you know, what these ancient services look like. But they have not thought to look at the, the, the way that liturgy is used in the primary chronicle to try to fill in some of the gaps in their knowledge. So for instance, um, something that stunned me was what I discovered or what I think I discovered, what I hope I discovered in the story of, of the very famous story of the martyrdom of Princess Boris and Gleb, which is, which, you know, is in the chronicle entry for 1015. So one of the things I tried to show in the book is that the way that Prince Boris and Prince Gleb are murdered, like what happens to them from the moment the assassins arrive as they, as they pray before, right before their death, the actual physical way that they're killed, the, the very specific liturgical terminology that is associated with what they say at that moment, that all of this is actually based on this deep Eucharistic subtext, which is depicting Prince Boris as a high priest preparing for Eucharistic sacrifice, and the sacrifice that is made is actually his brother, Prince Gleb. So I try to show in the book that everything that Prince Bo uh, Boris does from the moment he learns that the assassins are about to arrive is actually based on the precise liturgical ordo 
from moving from matins, which is the morning liturgical service, to the entrance prayers, to what's called the prosca media, or prothesis, and then which is ultimately consummated, just like it is in the divine liturgy, by the murder of his brother, who is described as a sweet-smelling sacrifice, a slovyesna uh, jirtva, which is this very specific epithet which comes from uh, the liturgy of Saint Basil the Great at the moment that the 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 lamb is 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 sacrificed and is consecrated. So when I stumbled onto that, that I just it blew me away. I couldn't believe it. Um, but then it became extraordinarily complicated because. Well, it turns out that those pre preparatory rites aren't in any of the 12th or 13th century, um, what are called eucologians, right? And so then I had to basically try to show the liturgists, like, well, if it's in the chronicle, then guess what? There were, this entrance prayer actually was there. Um, this, 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 you know, this prayer of, of, of entering the church was there. And our, and our proof is the, is the, is the tale of, among other things, is the tale of the martyrdom of Prince Boris and Club. It's all way more complicated than that, way more complicated than that. And you actually have to take a look at my book to, 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 to see the argument I'm actually making. But, you know, to simplify things, that's what I tried to do. Yeah. Well, I suppose the last thing I might say is like thinking of it in a very big picture way what what do i hope that my readership will take away from it more than anything it's about recovering the genuine role that liturgy played in the early middle ages um and then actually in the second chapter of the book i document what i call the liturgical turn in medieval studies uh, which began in, really in the 1970s with historians such as Rosman McKitterick, Janet Nelson, and others. Um, and I go on to show how you know this once neglected manuscript source, which in early Rus comprises over 70% of all of the extant manuscripts, um, you know how it eventually came to be taken seriously by some medieval historians. But unfortunately and remarkably, uh, if you open most books on Medi the early Middle Ages, you won't even know that the liturgy existed. And yet the men who were responsible for writing down basically everything that we have from the period celebrated those liturgical services, as I've said several times now, every day, all day long. So it's incredibly anachronistic and quite frankly misleading to reconstruct any version of the medieval past and not account for liturgy. So what I hope that the book is doing is that in its own tiny, tiny way, uh, it's restoring to its proper place the role of liturgy in this time period, uh, rather than what I think is a kind of anachronistic modern projection uh, of, of, a, of a world that reflects our academic preoccupations and not the preoccupations of the people that were actually producing these manuscripts. They, they cannot be divided even conceptually. Like you cannot divide king and cult in the early middle ages. Uh, when, when scholars do that, they are secularizing a profoundly non-secular age. <laughs> oh my God, thank you so much for caring to listen to me. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And I can't wait to see what you come up to. At least try to make me look smarter than I actually am. Thank you.